How are you doing? I hope you're doing well. And I hope this music we're playing is helping you get through whatever difficult or good time you may be having today. I'm Nikki Strong, and thanks for listening to VOA What The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Pete Musto, John Russell, and Brian Lynn. Later, Kelly Jean Kelly will present America's Presidents. But first, here is Pete Musto. Many creative people move to New York City in hopes of one day getting a job in show business or the arts. They often work as waiters in bars or restaurants while hoping for a big break as a performer, painter, or writer. But the coronavirus health crisis has put many servers out of work in recent months as eateries were forced to suspend their in-house dining services. And the future of what restaurant dining will look like is unclear even as New York City reopens. Some people wonder whether there will be enough business for bars and eateries to stay open and even have server jobs to fill. This raises questions about what that will mean for New York's creative class. Many servers fear the jobs that helped them live in the city and add to its artistic culture are no longer readily available. Travis McClung grew up in Texas. He told the Associated Press, it really is a part of the artist's life in New York, so I don't know what that's going to look like if it's just suddenly not an option anymore. McClung moved to New York in 2009 to study theater in college. Now 28 years old, he has spent close to nine years serving food while doing theater, singing, and more recently trying to build his career in video production. The coronavirus has been especially damaging for the city's restaurant workers. The New York State Department of Labor reports that restaurants and other eateries employed just over 273,000 people in February 2020. But that was before the city started closing down in March to fight the spread of COVID-19. In April, as case numbers jumped, the number of employees had fallen to under 78,000. As the city began reopening in May, the number rose to close to 100,000, still far below where it had been. New York has permitted outdoor dining service in recent weeks. Around 6,600 of the city's restaurants have requested permits to feed people on sidewalks and streets. But the return of indoor service has been delayed over fears that enclosed spaces would make virus cases rise. Rachel Berry moved to New York City from Maryland in 2004. She tried several different jobs, like dog walking and childcare, before moving to food service in 2016. Barry even spent some time at a traditional office job. But she found the structure too rigid to give her enough time to work on her creative interests. 
These have included painting, performing, and most recently, interior design work. She worries now about what will be available in restaurants as social distancing restrictions require eateries to limit crowds in the weeks to come. She also worries whether she would have to work even more in other jobs to make what she has been able to in food service. Am I going to have the same opportunities afforded to me financially, or, you know, am I going to be stuck in this I need two to three jobs to get by, Barry asked. Jen Lyon is the owner of Mean Red Productions, a company that organizes arts and music events. She worries that creative people may leave New York or choose not to come there at all because of the high cost of living. As someone who spent years bartending, she understands the importance for food service jobs and what they offer creative people. They are the best jobs to have when you need to focus on your art, especially in New York, she said. But now, if many of those jobs disappear, what happens in my world is suddenly I don't have young artists to work with because they can't afford New York, she said. You don't have people creating art in New York anymore. Losing creative people is also a huge threat to the city, said Eli Dvorkin. He serves as editorial and policy director at the Center for an Urban Future, which supports policies that make New York more equitable. As a city, we can't afford to lose our creative edge. It's been one of the drivers of the city's economic growth over the past decades, Dvorkin noted. I'm Pete Musto. August, a robot will begin placing food and drinks on store shelves in Japan. This is a test that the robot's maker hopes will create a wave of automation in retail stores. Automation is the process of using robots or computers, instead of people, for some jobs. The manufacturer of the robot worker is a Tokyo-based company called Telexistence. Following the test, store operator Family Mart says it plans to use such robots at 20 stores in and around Tokyo by 2022. One of Family Mart's competitors is the retail chain Lawson. That company will be testing its first robot in September, according to Telexistence. At first, people will operate the robots from a distance. These operations will continue until the machine's artificial intelligence, or AI, can learn to copy human-like movements. Jin Tomioka is the robot maker's chief executive. He noted how the technology lets people sense and experience places other than where they are. It advances the scope and scale of human existence, he said. The idea, called telexistence, was first proposed around 40 years ago by the company's co-founder, University of Tokyo professor Susumu Tachi. Telexistence calls its robot the Model T, after the famous Ford motor car. The Ford Model T began the era of mass car use around 100 years ago. 
The robot looks somewhat like an Australian animal, a kangaroo. The unusual design is meant to help people feel at ease. Many people feel uneasy around robots that look too human. Robots are still a rare sight in public. They also struggle with simple jobs in unexpected settings. Solving that problem could help businesses in some countries, especially those in rapidly aging Japan, deal with fewer workers. Businesses hit by the coronavirus may also need to operate with fewer people. Since the coronavirus crisis began, hotels, restaurants, and even oil companies have contacted Telexistence, Tomioka said. Nikki Harada is an official at Japan's Restaurant Workers Union. It's difficult to tell now what impact robots might have in restaurants. It could mean fewer people, but it could also create new jobs, Harada said. Although Family Mart will still need people to control its robots, operators can be anywhere. The operators can also be people who would not normally work in stores, said Tomohiro Kano, a general manager. There are about 1.6 million people in Japan who, for various reasons, are not active in the workforce, he said. I'm John Russell. Scientists and engineers are preparing for possible travel into interstellar space, the area in between stars in the distant future. A new report examines the possible problem of changes in language on long space trips. Only two spacecraft from Earth have reached the mysterious area known as interstellar space. Scientists identify interstellar space as the area outside the area of particles and magnetic fields created by the Sun. Experts believe it will likely take many years before the technology and equipment are developed to send humans to this unexplored area of space. But if it does happen, massive spaceships could carry humans on long trips to distant stars. Two American researchers have explored one possible problem with such travel. They considered the possibility that changes in human language could develop over time and lead to major communication problems with people on Earth. The language experts are Professors Andrew McKenzie from the University of Kansas and Jeffrey Punsky of Southern Illinois University. The two recently published a paper on the subject that appears in the European Space Agency's online publication, Acta Futura. The paper considers very long trips necessary to reach interstellar space, estimated to be about 18 billion kilometers from Earth. It also examines the possibility of future colonization of distant stars. Languages naturally change as communities grow more isolated from each other, the researchers note in the paper. The long isolation of a community could lead to enough differences in language to make it impossible for community members back home 
to understand. If you're on this spaceship for ten generations, new concepts will emerge, new social issues will come up, and people will create ways of talking about them, Mackenzie said in a statement. Such vocabulary would become specific to only that spaceship. People on Earth might never know about these words unless there's a reason to tell them. And the further away you get, the less you're going to talk to people back home, McKinsey said. The researchers noted that in addition to new words being used, the language of people traveling on spaceships and living in colonies would experience many other changes. For example, the sounds of different letters would likely change over time, affecting not only individual words, but the whole grammatical system, the paper states. Major changes in word and sentence structure could also create systematic language barriers over time, the researchers said. Given more time, New grammatical forms can completely replace current ones, McKinsey said. The paper provides examples of how languages developed on our own planet because communities became isolated over time. Examples include the Polynesian settlement of far flung Pacific islands and dialect development in relatively isolated European colonies. McKinsey identified an example of a major language change on Earth during modern times. He described a way of speaking called uptalk when speakers end statements with a rising tone. He said this way of speaking is often mistaken for a question tone by those who are not aware of it. Uptalk has only been observed occurring within the last 40 years, but has spread from small groups of young Americans and Australians to most of the English speaking world, Mackenzie said. The researchers say one possible solution to limit communication problems would be to include language experts on spaceship crews. Another suggestion is to use sign language as a form of communication. McKinsey added that space travelers might question whether it is even worth trying to learn how to communicate with people on Earth. But he believes there will always be a need, even if it is very limited. You have to learn a little Earth English to send messages back or to read the instruction manuals and information that came with the ship, he said. I'm Brian Lynn. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about Theodore Roosevelt, the 26th President of the United States. Many Americans like to call him Teddy Roosevelt or even TR. These nicknames for the president show that Roosevelt was, in general, popular with the public. He is one of the four presidents whose face can be seen on Mount Rushmore, a memorial to famous U.S. leaders. Historians note that Roosevelt's term in office marks the beginning of the modern presidency. In other words, he expanded the position and used the media to connect with the public. Among Americans, his public image is often linked to youth, energy, strength, 
courage, and playfulness. But his image has also been linked to a strong liking for military action and for oneself. Theodore Roosevelt is also often tied to the American West, but he was born and raised on the East Coast in New York City. His father was a wealthy businessman. His mother was from a Southern planter family that owned slaves. Theodore Roosevelt had two sisters and a brother. His family called him by another nickname, Teedy. When he was a boy, Young Theodore was often sick. He had asthma, a lung condition that could make physical activity difficult. So, as he got older, Roosevelt strengthened his body. For the rest of his life, he strongly believed in physical exercise and vigorous activity, what he called the strenuous life. Young Roosevelt also had hunger for learning. He studied with private tutors, traveled overseas, and studied many subjects while in college at Harvard. After his college years, he studied law briefly and then began serving in public office in New York. But tragedy halted his early government service. Roosevelt had married Alice Hathaway Lee, who soon became pregnant. But two days after the baby was born, Roosevelt's wife died of kidney disease. And as it happened, Roosevelt's mother died on the same day, in the same house. She suffered from Bright's disease, another disorder affecting the kidneys. The future president was struck by grief. He left his baby daughter with his sister and went to the American West. There, Roosevelt lived as a cowboy, hunting, riding horses, taking part in cattle drives, and even chasing people who broke the law. The experience helped define Roosevelt's life and beliefs. But after two years, he was ready to return to the East Coast. There, he married Edith Kermit Caro, a woman he had known since childhood. They settled in a house on Long Island, New York, and raised Roosevelt's daughter, Alice. He and Edith also had five other children. His family supported Roosevelt's rise in Republican Party politics, including his campaign to become governor of New York. But some of the party officials were not happy with Roosevelt. They did not like his independence, and they did not want him to be reelected as governor. So they plotted to have him nominated as U.S. Vice President in the election of 1900. They believed Roosevelt would not be able to give them much trouble in that position. As the Republican leaders hoped, Roosevelt and the sitting president, William McKinley, won both the popular and electoral vote in a landslide. But less than a year later, McKinley was dead. And with that, Republican leaders found that the man they wanted to get out of their way was now the country's 26th president. When he became president, Roosevelt was only 42 years old. He is still the youngest person to hold that office. At first, Roosevelt promised to continue the policies of McKinley, who was, after all, the president voters had reelected. But Roosevelt quickly put his own mark on the presidency. He is known for trying to balance the needs of many groups in society, including business owners, farmers, and workers. Roosevelt called his program the Square Deal. In other words, he suggested that everyone was treated fairly. However, some Americans objected to Roosevelt reducing the power of big businesses. They said his use of government rules, in general, did not let market forces operate freely. Roosevelt is also known for protecting the nation's wilderness areas. 
he set aside more than 800,000 square kilometers of land to protect nature and wildlife. In his foreign policy, Roosevelt was energetic. He helped Panama win independence from Colombia in order to start building the Panama Canal. He also defended, and even added to, the Monroe Doctrine, an idea from the presidency of James Monroe. Roosevelt confirmed that the United States would bar European powers from intervening in South America, and more than that, that the U.S. would police the Western Hemisphere and make sure that countries honored their international obligations. In other words, Roosevelt believed the United States had the right and responsibility to be a world power. If diplomatic negotiations did not work, he was not afraid to threaten the use of force. He famously said, Speak softly and carry a big stick. You will go far. Voters approved of Roosevelt's actions, or at least they enjoyed his leadership and his young family that played all over the White House. In 1904, Roosevelt easily won the presidency in his own right. He is the first vice president who took power after the death of a sitting president to earn his own term. Although he was permitted to seek another term as president, Roosevelt promised not to. He left the White House in 1909, still a very young man. For a while, he traveled overseas. But when he returned home, he did not like the direction the new president and the Republican Party was going. So Roosevelt created a new political group called the Progressive Party, or as some called it, the Bull Moose Party. Not surprisingly, the term Bull Moose was meant to suggest Roosevelt and his animal-like strength. Although he earned many votes, Roosevelt did not win the 1912 election. Instead, he split the votes of the Republican Party and permitted a Democrat to win the presidency. Roosevelt's efforts were not entirely lost, however, Later presidents, including Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, John Kennedy, and Lyndon Johnson, used many of his ideas for reform. And major U.S. political parties today often find lessons from Roosevelt's presidency they admire or support. Both Democrat Bill Clinton and Republican George W. Bush said Theodore Roosevelt was one of their role models. In the years after the 1912 election, Roosevelt remained active. He traveled, campaigned, and continued to try to influence politics from his home in New York, where he died unexpectedly in his sleep at age 60. One public official observed, death had to take Roosevelt sleeping, for if he had been awake, there would have been a fight. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.